day two of tryhackme.com and I'm doing this as a, a, a unlisted live stream just to save me the time of uploading so you're getting my real-time interactions with this they sent me an email uh, reminding me to keep working on learning this so I'm gonna click continue learning I expect that'll take me to the website and a place to continue where I was at and it looks like I actually have to log in and uh, here my tryhackme.com credentials are remembered I'm not a robot some days I might feel like a robot please verify your email address I did do that I remember doing that uh, cookies fine got it intro to offensive security now I'm going to do introduction to defensive security to receive an email I've already done that I'm not going to do that now so I'll go into intro to defensive security allow notifications introduction to defensive security offensive security focuses on one thing breaking into systems Breaking into systems might be achieved through exploiting bugs, abusing insecure setups, and taking advantage of unenforced access control policies, among other things. Red teams and penetration testers specialize in offensive security. Defensive security is somewhat the opposite of offensive security, as it is concerned with two main tasks, preventing intrusions from occurring and detecting intrusions when they occur and responding properly. Blue teams are part of the defensive security landscape. Some of the tasks that are related to defensive security include user cybersecurity awareness. Training users about cybersecurity helps protect against various attacks that target their symptoms systems. This is something that really concerns me and part of the reason why I'm going through this is because I need to be able to train my clients and uh, what their staff need to be able to do for good defense. Documenting and managing assets, we need to know the types of systems and devices that we have to manage and protect properly. Updating and patching systems, ensuring that computer servers and network devices are correctly updated and patched against known vulnerability weaknesses. This is something that I think gets missed in businesses that are of the size that I typically work with in my uh, business. Uh, uh, providing computer support to small businesses. Setting up preventative security devices, firewall and intrusion prevention systems are critical components of preventative security. Firewalls control what network traffic can go inside and what can leave the system or network. IPS blocks any network traffic that matches present rules and attack signatures. And this is an area that I need to be better at. And I think computer consultants at my level probably are feeling this need as well. Setting up logging and monitoring devices. Without proper logging and monitoring of the network, it, it won't be possible to detect malicious activities and intrusions. If a new unauthorized device appears on our network, we should be able to know. Now, a problem with, with some of this in small businesses is cost. Uh, small businesses are, are far more sensitive to cost than the major large corporations that have entire security departments and specialists within their security department. Uh, in, a, in a small business, it's often a single computer technician, consultant such as myself, managing the security and possibly for multiple clients. And so it just doesn't happen to spend the kind of money that a a computer, a computer technician would get trained in school to do this, that, and the other thing, and there's absolutely no concern or awareness that the company can't afford it and stay profitable. The business managers, when they look at spending this amount of money for protection against something that they have never encountered a problem with, that's a hard sell. Once they do experience a major loss, then they're a little easier to do that, but it's a, it's a bitter pill 
for them to swallow because it cuts into their profits. They are the whole reason they are in business is to make profit. So when you come at them with more money to spend, it's it's a hard sell. So we got to look for ways that we can do it inexpensively. There is much more to defensive security and the list only covers a few common topics. Maybe this is a role that I'm going to provide in the industry at, at large is finding ways and encouraging people to implement the things that are more affordable to do. And uh, the big dollar <laughs> computer consultants are wanting to throw big money out all the time. Small business can't afford that. And even those big businesses that are throwing out that money, they still fall victim to attacks. If a sufficiently funded and skilled attacker is going to go after any institution or company or business, they're probably going to get through. So then what do we do with it once that happens? Security Operations Center is what's known as SOC. In, you know, in this room we cover. Now by room, they're meaning this lesson. They're calling this a room. Up here in the URL at the top, tryhackme.com forward slash room. So rooms within tryhackme.com refers to what the rest of us civilians might call a lesson. Security Operations Center, Threat Intelligence, Digital Forensic and Incident Response with another acronym, DFIR. Digital Forensics and Incident Response. Malware Analysis. Answer the questions below. Which team focuses on defense security? Answer format. So they're not giving me a multiple choice here. That would be perhaps a blue team or the defense team. Um, let's, let's try blue team. See if it'll accept that. Yep, and I like that. Answer is correct. Areas of defensive security. Uh, okay, so this is another phase of the lesson. And then at the end of this, does it have a question down here at the bottom? Uh, yes, it has three lessons. Let's see, can I challenge that? What would you call a team of cybersecurity professionals that monitors the network and its systems for malicious events? Defenders? or Oh, they're... Oh, they're wanting three words. I'm getting it now. Answer format. It's wanting it in three words. So it's not blue team. It should be something contained in this lesson. What does DFIR stand for? Digital Forensic Intelligence Response. Which kind of malware requires the user to pay money to regain access to their files? That would be ransomware. All right. So let's go ahead through the lesson. In this task, we'll cover two main topics related to defense security. Security Operations Center, SOC, where we cover threat intelligence. Digital Forensics and Incident Response. So there's that DFIR again. Digital Forensics and Incident Response. Security Operations Center. So here they're going to talk about the SOC. Then I'm going to guess there's another section for DFIR. So here's DFIR. Within SOC, we have this section, Threat Intelligence. And within DFIR, we have subheadings of Digital Forensics. Okay, that makes sense in this part of the name. And then Incident Response. So they're going to detail those two parts of that name here. Within here, we're going to have these four sections, Preparation, Detection and Analysis, Containment, Eradication, and Recovery, Post-Incident Activity. And then after the incident response, there's Malware Analysis. And then we have the questions. Okay, now we kind of have a higher level orientation to this lesson. A Security Operations Center is a team of cybersecurity professionals. Okay, so there's that three word. Security Operations Center. I bet that's one of these questions down here. What do you, what do you call a team of cybersecurity professionals that monitors the network and its systems for malicious events? Security Operations Center. I'm going to expect that that's going to be our answer to that. It's a team of cybersecurity professionals that monitors the networks and its systems to detect 
malicious cybersecurity events. Is that exactly how they worded it? For malicious events. That's close enough. A little bit of a change of wording. Some of the main areas of interest for SOC are there's vulnerabilities, policy violations, unauthorized activity, network intrusions. All right, so now, vulnerabilities. Whenever a system vulnerability or weakness is discovered, it is essential to fix it by installing a proper update or patch. When a fix is not available, the necessary measures should be taken to prevent an attacker from exploiting it. Although remediating vulnerabilities is of vital interest to a SOC, it is not necessarily assigned to them. Okay, so they might not be the ones to actually perform that action. Policy violations. Of course, in my size business, I am everything, so it will be my responsibility. Policy violations. We can think of a security policy as a set of rules required for the protection of the network and systems. For example, it might be a policy violation if, a users, if users start uploading confidential company data to an online storage service. Now, I'm going through policy creations for one of my clients right now. Well, we got multiple files that each have multiple pages of numbered paragraphs. Each one of them is a separate policy, security policy. Unauthorized activity. Consider the case where a user's login name and password are stolen and the attacker uses them to log into the network. A SOC needs to detect such an event and block it as soon as possible before further damage is done. Network intrusions. Now again, this is, this is the fourth of what's referred to as the main areas of interest for the Security Operations Center, also known as SOC. Network intrusions. No matter how good your security is, even these companies that pay multiple millions of dollars to fund their security department, and yes, the numbers get that high, no matter how good your security is, there is always a chance for an intrusion. An intrusion can occur when a user clicks on a malicious link or when an attacker exploits a public server. Either way, when an intrusion occurs, we must detect it as soon as possible to prevent further damage. Security operations cover various tasks to ensure protection. One such task, one such task, is threat intelligence. And this graphic looks like this is staff people keeping an eye on several different areas in order to detect a violation or a intrusion or unauthorized activity. So now threat intelligence is a section we're dealing with now. So let's see, how are they bringing us to this. The SOC, where we cover threat intelligence. So in the SOC, there's these main areas of interest. And then here we're going to cover or define threat intelligence. In this context, intelligence refers to information you gather about actual and potential enemies. A threat is any action that can disrupt or adversely affect a system. Threat intelligence, put those two words together, aims to gather information to help the company better prepare against potential adversaries. The purpose would be to achieve a threat-informed defense. Different companies have different adversaries. Some adversaries might seek to steal customer data from a mobile operator. However, other adversaries are interested in halting the production in a petroleum refinery. All right, I'm seeing where they're getting this. Different companies, different businesses, whatever you're doing is going to have different adversaries. 
Example adversaries include a nation-style cyber army working for political reasons and a ransomware group acting for financial purposes. So showing those two different types of adversaries. Based on the company, the target, the, 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 the mark, <laughs> we can expect different adversaries. So here, I guess they're implying different adversaries funneling down through a funnel and coming out with different threats. Intelligence needs data. In order for you to have intelligence, you need to have data. Data has to be collected, processed, and analyzed. So is this the data up here being collected and processed? Data collection is done from local sources such as network logs and public sources such as forums. Okay, so network logs would be collecting the data on your network, things that are happening, actual network traffic activity on your network. That would be data. Public sources such as forums, you would be acquiring data about threat actors and what they are doing these days processing of data to arrange them into a format suitable for analysis. Okay, so when they're referring to processing, the data has to be collected, process. They're taking, taking the data, they're, they're, say, they're saying, take the data from these different sources. What processing aims to do is to arrange that data into a format suitable for analysis. Now, I'm not just rephrasing these things and describing them for your benefit. It's for my benefit as well. If you think I'm being too wordy and you're, and you're frustrated with my style, here, don't watch this video. It's not for you. This video is substantially in part for me. This is my learning process. If you benefit from watching me go through this learning so that you don't have to go do it yourself, hey, great. Then watch the videos. Otherwise, go somewhere else. This, uh, the analysis phase seeks to find more information about the attackers and their motives. Moreover, it aims to create a list of recommendations and actionable steps. That makes total sense. So here they have talked about the data collection and the processing and the analysis. This last sentence, the analysis phase seeks to find more information about the attackers or most. So once you've delayed, collected this information from the different sources and you're analyzing it and your objective in analyzing it is to create a list of recommendations and actionable steps to do. Learning about your adversaries allows you to know their tactics, techniques, and procedures. As a result of threat intelligence, which is all this up here in the prior paragraph, we identify the threat actor, the adversary, predict their activity, and consequently, we'll be able to mitigate their attacks and prepare a response strategy. So something I'm gonna be looking for is threat actors who go after small business. The threat actors that are going after government institutions, big utilities, large business corporations, that's, I'm not so interested in them. I need to focus my data collection from the web about threat actors of, on the ones that are going after small businesses, maybe medium businesses. And keeping in mind that script kiddies is I, I think that's called script kiddies as in K-I-D-D-I-E-S, not kiddies as in K-I-T-T-I-E-S. I haven't even Googled it. I don't know. But script kiddies are beginning hackers, beginning criminals early in their career. They're not very good. They're not very educated. But I think they're the ones that are going after the small targets, which would be my clients. So we need to know that we're protected against that type of threat actor. That narrows down the range of 
activities that I need in my response strategy or my recommendations and actionable steps, that's probably going to be far more affordable for me to go after for my clients. You know what? I might have been able to imagine that and put that together yesterday, but until I went through this lesson, that has not been a clear point in my mind. I just, that's a significant benefit for me in this lesson right here, because I've been over, kind of overwhelmed with this whole thing, meaning, geez, these big corporate institutions with their big money spent in their um, IT departments and then their security departments within the IT department and multiple full-time staff people not being able to protect them against um, intrusions. How do I have a, any hope of protecting my clients? Well, here's the answer. I don't need to protect against that level of threat. I need to protect against the level of threat that's coming after my clients. So you just saw an aha moment for me. Digital forensics and incident response. So this is after a problem has occurred and I have had problems occur among my clients. This should help me get a more strategic and, and what? methodical response for when it happens again, because I'm fully convinced it will happen again. Maybe not the same event, but troubles will happen amongst my clients, I'm sure of it. This section is about digital forensics and incident response, DFIR. <laughs> you know what? I just realized, pronounce that as a word, defer. Don't I like to kick the can down the road and defer things? So <laughs> that's kind of kind of makes a comical sense to me. Digital forensics and incidents response. We'll defer doing that until after the problem occurs, which actually makes sense. You can't do digital forensics and incident response before the intrusion occurs. So we defer that work. <laughs> All right. Moving on, digital forensics, incident response, malware analysis. So they got digital forensics is the first one. Incident response is the second one. That's one and two. And then they've added on to that, tacked on to it, malware analysis, I suppose as part of, is that part of the response or part of the forensics? It's, it's kind of seems all lumped together to me. So here we have detail on digital forensics, detail on incident response. Do they give us detail on malware analysis? They do. So good. That's going to kind of quantify that better for me, I think. We'll see if I'm right at the end of this. Forensics is the application of science to investigate crimes and establish facts with the use and spread of digital systems such as computers and smartphones a new branch of forensics was born to investigate related crimes, computer forensics, which later evolved into digital forensics. The word forensics has been around for a long time for like criminal forensics. In defensive security, the focus, now I've got, I've got TV shows of criminal forensics on my mind. <laughs> I'm not going to go down that road. In defensive security, the focus of digital forensics shifts. Can you tell the sun's going down? In defensive security, the focus of digital forensics shifts to analyzing evidence of an attack and its perpetuators and other areas such as intellectual property, theft, intellectual property theft, cyber espionage, and possession of unauthorized content. Consequently, digital forensics will focus on different areas, such as file system, system memory, system logs, network logs. So those are the four different areas they're identifying that digital forensics will focus on. 
because the focus of digital forensics shifts to analyzing evidence of an attack and its per perpetrators. So we want the evidence of the attack and the evidence of the perpetrators and other areas such as intellectual property theft, cyber espionage, possession of unauthorized content. So intellectual property theft, like for a company that is inventing things, developing new products. Or in my case, I have a lot of attorney's offices. Intellectual, intellectual property theft could be the information about the cases that they're working on. That's their work product. So that could be intellectual property theft. Cyber espionage. So that would be like connecting to my client's computers and messing with them, damaging them, or spying on them. Is that what espionage is? Possession of unauthorized content. So that'll be downloading files from my client's computers. All right, file system. Analyzing a digital forensics image, a low-level copy. So I make copies of disk drives, storage media using uh, Macrim Reflect, creating images. Also, Magnusbox, can, uh, which is a cloud-based backup system. It can do images also. So digital forensics of an image, which is a low level copy or an image of a system storage reveals much information such as installed programs, created files, partially overwritten files, and deleted files. When you create an image, that image includes the files that have been flagged as deleted. They're no longer visible to the users but they are still on the storage drive. Now, actually, when I do an image backup using Macrim Reflect, I'm not, I'm not doing a, what do you call a, um, uh, a forensic image. I'm not doing a forensic image typically. I'm just doing the actual file system of active files. It does not include the deleted files and the unused storage space. That's a different type of image backup. I don't typically do that because it takes a lot longer to, to run the backup. So I'm not, I don't have forensic images available on my client's computers. Maybe I need to look at that. Well, after an incident occurs, you want to create a forensic image. That's when to do it. System memory, if the attacker is running their malicious program in memory without saving it to the disk, taking a forensic image of the system memory is the best way to analyze its contents and learn about the attack. I've never done that. I've never made a forensic image of what's in memory. By the way, when I move my head, that bright light you see, in the, that, that's, the, that's the light that is shining on me reflected in the window that's behind me. And then you see a rectangle in the window behind me. I, that's a reflection of the, the large all-in-one computer that I'm using. Huh, that's funny. All right, squirrel. Where was I? Yeah, okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so if an attacker is actually running their program in memory, they can do that without actually writing any files to the disk, to the storage media. So um, to be able to make a forensic image of what's in the computer's memory, to do that without adversely impacting the criminal's content within memory, that, that's got to be some special utilities that I don't at the current know currently know how to do or say with in, in English words very well. Okay, so system logs. Each client and server computer maintains different logs about what is happening. Log files provide plenty of information about what happened on a system. Some traces will be left even if the attacker tries to clear their traces. Now I do use 
system in the event viewer for system logs and application logs and um, two other logs. I don't remember what they are right now. Installation log, whatever. So is that the logs they're talking about or is this some other logs? I think it's probably those logs. Network logs. Logs of the network packets that have traversed a network would help answer more questions about whether an attack is occurring and what it entails. I currently have one client where we do have network traffic logs being stored and saved for a period of time. I am tasked with, will be tasked with, reviewing and evaluating those logs. We haven't got to that phase of our development yet with that client of mine. Incident response. Okay, so here we're dealing with digital forensics. That we did that part, incident response we're working on now. And all of this combined is the DFIR. Both of these sections combined is the DFIR. Incident response. An incident usually refers to a data breach or cyber attack. However, in some cases, it can be something less critical such as misconfiguration, an intrusion attempt, or a policy violation. Examples of a cyber attack include an attacker making our network or systems inaccessible, defacing or changing the public website, and data breach, which would be stealing data. How would you respond to a cyber attack? Incident response specifies the methodology that should be followed to handle such a case. The aim is to reduce damage and recover in the shortest time possible. Ideally, you would develop a plan ready for incident response. We have a plan for this client that I have mentioned a few times. We've ha we have these policies, multiple files, different sections of uh, can, different sections of the policy contain multiple files. Each file contains multiple paragraphs, each one of those a separate individual policy. We have policies for incident response, how to proceed with that. I don't know that. That's not committed, but to memory. I have it in written form. I don't know it like the back of my hand, and I need to know this stuff better. Hence, I'm going through this course. I always find that teaching something helps me learn it better. So these videos, I'm teaching it, regardless of whether there's any audience that's interested in watching it. And me doing this extra conversation about it helps me lock it in my mind. It's more about me learning it better than me teaching it to you. So I'm a learner here. The four major phases of the incident response processes are, so here's the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. Four major phases, preparation, detection and analysis, containment, eradication and recovery, post-incident activity. Now, the first one, preparation. This requires, when you're learning something like this, don't just read through it, okay? See how I'm doing it. This is how you learn something. Preparation, this requires a team trained and ready to handle incidents. A team of one who's doing all of the IT support work, yeah, I don't know. This requires a team trained and ready to handle incidents. See, I'm going to be trained and ready to handle minor incidents from script kiddies. If we get big deal hits, I'm going to have, we're going to, have to be looking to hire an incident response company. And they do, the companies, there are companies that do that. Ideally, various measures are put into place to prevent incidents from happening in the first place. So if an incident happens and an incident response team is hired to deal with it, they're going to be looking at my preventative measures. I need to get my preventative measures up to snuff. 
detection and analysis. The team has the necessary resources to detect any incident. Moreover, it is essential to further analyze any detected incident to learn about its severity. Now, the team has the necessary resources to detect any incident. That's going to be dependent upon, in part, my preparation. What have I put into place in advance so that it can be a resource for the team? They will come in with their own tools and resources that will be able to help you know, evaluate what has happened independent of my preparation. But my preparation is going to help them be leaps and bounds ahead of the game and get us a quicker result, more thorough result, less damage to my clients. Containment, eradication, and recovery. This is the third of those four major phases. Containment, eradication and recovery. So these two at the beginning, that's before any fixes. Preparation is before the problem has happened. Detection and analysis is the first thing that happens once a problem has happened. Then after the detection and analysis, and I've, I've read, I've, I've, I've heard stories, I've had podcasts is normally where I get my, my content about this of actual, in, actual incident responses. And what they do, they don't jump right on cutting off the intrusion. They want to detect and analyze it for a little while before they cut it off. So once they're ready to contain and eradicate, then they go after it. Once an incident is detected, it is crucial to stop it from affecting other systems, eliminate it, and recover the affected systems. For instance, when we notice that a system is infected with a computer virus, we would likely stop, meaning contain, the virus from spreading to other systems, clean, meaning eradicate the virus, and ensure proper system recovery. Now, in the incident responses that I have followed on podcasts and audiobooks typically, I'm not much of a book reader, audiobooks is my go-to. Um, they've made, they've impressed upon me the point that they, 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 they want to be able to, they want to know what it is before they try to stop it. Because the intruder, the intruder may have other back doors. And if they just stop one infection and then try to move forward, the intruder may have another back door that they might not implement for days or weeks later. And if you go, if you jump too quickly on shutting down the intruder without investigating first, you know, you might have more troubles down the road. So they're not mentioning that here in this content. Maybe that's an advanced lesson. Maybe this material isn't going to include that at all. I don't know. Post-incident activity. After successful recovery, a report is produced and the learned lesson is shared to prevent similar future incidents. Now that's where I'm benefiting from with these po podcasts and audiobooks where I'm, I'm hearing about other intrusions. Now the, the problem with that though is I'm hearing about these big intrusions that are not going to be hitting my clients. I need a source of incident reporting of businesses at the level of my clients. And I, I, I haven't come across that. So that's a need. If any of those of you watching this, if you come up with that or stumble across it, please let me know. All you gotta do is put a comment in a video and it'll get to me. Preparation, now here's, um, oh, these are the four items. Preparation, detection, analysis, containment, eradication, recovery, post-incident activity. Now, malware analysis. Malware stands for malicious software. Okay, so mal being the first part of that word and 
where being the last part of the word software. Software refers to programs, documents, and files. That, you know what? That wasn't an aha moment for me. <laughs> I just detailed that out. Software refers to programs, documents, and files that you can save on a disk or send over a network. Malware includes many types, such as virus, Trojan horse, ransomware. Okay, so they're only mentioning three here. I think there's probably more. Vi but those are the, certainly the major ones. Malware, uh, virus is a piece of code, part of a program that attaches itself to a program it is designed to spread from one computer to another. Moreover, it works by altering, overwriting, and deleting files once it infects a computer. The result ranges from the computer becoming slow to unusable. Well, I would, th I, I would, th result? No, I'd call that a side effect. That's, I don't think that's its objective. I don't think it's the objective of a virus to make the computer slow or unusable. It, it has other objectives, maybe just to, maybe to delete files, maybe to take over the computer, turn the computer into a, a bot uh, to perform work for the, the uh, command and control for the criminal who's behind this attack. Now, they're also implying here that a virus is part of a program, whereas it's not the complete program file itself is not considered a virus, but it's just a part of the, pro of the program code within that program file. Nah, I don't know, that seems a little really narrow. Maybe, that, maybe that's an official definition of virus. I'm not aware of that. Trojan Horse is a program, an entire program, that shows one desirable function but hides a malicious function underneath. For example, a victim might download a video player from a shady website that gives the attacker complete control over the system. And I want to modify that a little bit. I'm a little uncomfortable with the way they worded that. A victim might download a video player from a completely legitimate appearing website. Video web player on a legitimate website that website might have been compromised and the criminal has replaced the video player that's on that website for a downloading with a modified version that has a has trojan code within it i i'm really i'm really uneasy when people refer to shady websites cuz they say did you go to a shady website uh, what yeah, I, 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 find, I, I find the most common thing that my clients call me with is these pop-up messages. Your computer is infected with a virus. They get an audible message, really scary message. Call this number to, 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 to let us help fix it. Virus has been detected. Those have always happened with my clients going to a legitimate, respectable website clicking on something that and that website has been compromised and I have proven this because on occasion my clients been able to show me what they clicked on we go back and click on it again and we get the same result the times when I've been able to see that it has been on the MSN um, website that comes up msn.com when Microsoft Edge just gives you their default with all these advertised things and on the upper left corner with a major clickbait stuff is showing, my client clicks on one of those and it pops up all these messages, meaning Microsoft, it's not a way, shady website, but it has been compromised. Now, I don't think it's Microsoft has been compromised. compromised. I think it is the advertising content that makes up those clickbaits that that uh, whatever when you click on that the website that that takes you to that website has been compromised and that's where these infections occur 
but it comes off of something that you click on from msn.com. You didn't go to a shady website. I'm, ha I ha I'm uneasy with them making reference to that because it makes people sound like, oh, I don't go to web shady websites. What is a shady website? Shady.com? Hey, I don't like that. Ransomware is a malicious program that encrypts the user's files. I have had that happen with one of my clients when ransomware was a brand new thing. We were one of the first ones hit. That's another story. I'm not going to go into that now. I have told about it before on my channel, but if you want to hear that story, come into a Saturday live stream event and ask it there. I'll repeat it again during a live stream event as somebody asks about it there. Encryption makes the files unreadable without knowing the encryption password. The attacker offers the user the encryption password if the user is willing to pay a ransom. Malware analysis aims to learn about such malicious programs using various me means. Static analysis works by inspecting the malicious program without running it. So you're looking at the program code, decoding it, decompiling it, looking at the actual commands within the code. That is a thing. You can do that. Well, maybe you can't, but maybe I can't, but there are people who can. Usually this requires solid knowledge of assembly language. Yes, indeed. Now, because the program might have been written in any number of different languages, but that's a high-level programming language, then it gets compiled. Now, though, when you decompiling it, decompile it, I think the only thing you can do is decompile it, decompile it to assembly language. And then, so you got to be able to read the assembly commands. They don't decompile it to the original language that it was created in. Yeah, for the right name, that is Processor's Instruction Set, i.e. the computer's fundamental instructions. Like that makes it any clearer to civilians. Dynamic analysis works by running the malware in a controlled environment and monitoring its activities. It lets you observe how the malware behaves when running. I do think that down the road, as I progress further, I will probably be implementing virtual computers and additional firewalls and um, um, uh, not proxy servers. The thing where you, <laughs> I, oh, many of you know the name that I'm struggling for when you're when you're showing the internet that you're actually located at a different location. Let's just, let's just say that this is a quiz for all, QFA, for you to type into the comments or into the chat room if I do this as a premiere. What is the word that I'm trying to think of? And just, I'm getting a little tired. You can tell that I'm slurring my words a little bit, maybe. The word that I'm trying to think of. Um, it's not a virtual PC. It's where you're not letting the internet see your actual public IP address. So I'm going to pretend that I know what that word is and I'm just pretending that I don't know what it is so that I can do a QFA, quiz for all, and you can type that into the chat comments. What would you call a team of cybersecurity professionals that monitors a network and its system for malicious events? Am I going to remember that? It's already pointed it out. I know it's up at the top of this screen. Yeah, I'm going to have to go up here and see what they call it. Security Operations Center? That doesn't really sound right. The Team Security Operations Center. Let's see if that's what they want. Security operations center. I mean, that doesn't sound like a team. That sounds like a department. Yeah, they like that. I don't like they call it a team. Security operations center. Do they call it a team? 
Security, yeah, they did say it's a team of cyber security professionals. All right. All right, no, that's what you say, that's what you say. What does DFR stands for? So I'm gonna see if I can do this from memory. Digital Forensics I, Information Resource Reconnaissance inter Intelligence, Digital Forensics Intelligence? Intelligence a research? I don't think so. I think I'm way off on this. Getting it wrong helps to learn it better. So I'm not even going to click the button there. I'm going to go up and read Digital Forensics and Incident Response because I actually want to type it out. Digital Forensics and Incident Response and Submit. Whoop, whoop, your answer is correct in the upper right corner. There should be a sound effect going along with that. Now I need a single word. Which kind of malware requires the user to pay money to regain access to their files? I know this one well. Ransom, no, there's no E. Ransomware, right? I think that's spelled right, and I don't think they capitalized the W, right? Ransomware, do we confirm that up here? Where was ransomware? Um, I'm getting a little loopy. There it is, ransomware, do not capitalize the W. This is task three. So I've completed task two and task three during this video. My intention was to only do one task per video, whoops. My mistake. This is still task three. Oh no, that was task two. This is task three starting now. So no, I completed task two. Oh, I see how these go. So I'll collapse that, expand this. So in the first video, I did task one. The second video, I did task two. So I'm naming these videos with those 001, 002, and then there'll be 003. Now, I don't know what they're going to take me into next. Is it maybe I may wind up <clears throat> renaming these videos so that maybe T2 or maybe there's section one, task one, things like that. I don't know yet. Right now, these videos are named. Let's go back here to my channel tab. Here, track tryhackme.com001, my experience. This video, I think, is going to be named when I publish it, tryhackme.com002, my experience. All right? So that'll do it for this video. How long have I been? 53 minutes. I live streamed this as an unlisted stream so it's easy for me to just change it to a either a premiere or a uploaded video all right i hope that's been useful have a great day catch you later goodbye